Hongong Good morning. I will be speaking in Latvian, so please, uh, if you do not know Latvian, please get your headphones and put them on if you want to know what's going on. So I need the translation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So let us wait till everyone who needs grabs headphones. Some technical details at first. The conference will have two working languages, Latvian and English. The speakers will be speaking either Latvian or English, so please uh, have your headsets at reach so that you can understand everything which is being spoken in either of the languages. The audience is kindly invited to ask questions in microphone. Even if you have loud voice, we invite you to use microphone, otherwise interpreters won't hear you and you, and you won't be he heard also online on our live report. Here you can see the link for our online broadcast. I would like to invite you to share it. Uh, good morning. My name is Kristina Garina. I'm, uh, uh, I'm the head of the board of uh, LGBT and their friend uh, association Mosaic. You're invited to the conference. Where are we heading? The future is in our hands the next 10 years in the protection of LGBT rights. The conference is organized with help of Rose Luxemburg Foundation and the Council of Europe. Here we also have representatives from the Rose Luxemburg Foundation. They will greet you in the conference briefly. This conference is part of the 10th anniversary events of our association. The reason for organizing this conference is that during the 10 years of our activity, we have had several conferences where we looked back at what has happened, what are the developments, what is the state of play. We were less speaking about what to do in the future and what to expect. Therefore, today our aim is to focus on the next 10 years, our directions of activities, what we want to do and what we can do, what we want to change and what instruments do we have. We have invited several colleagues from other countries to share their experiences. Hopefully this experience sharing will be useful for setting our aims for the upcoming 10 years. In Latvian context, we would like to speak about our aims in general and about Latvia's responsibilities, duties, and opportunities in the LGBT area. Hopefully, today we will reach at least some of the answers and solutions to the question what are our rights, what are our duties, and what to expect in the upcoming 10 years. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague from the Council of Europe, Yuri de Boer. Uh, Christina, and good morning, everyone. Um, I will be speaking in English, so the people who are not using the headphones now might need the, uh, people switch headphones. Um, I'm very happy to see so many people here on this uh, chilly and uh, a little bit a little bit sunny and early hour here in, in, in Riga. Um, my name is Yuri de Boer. I work for the Council of Europe, which is based in Strasbourg. Um, and as you may or may not know, the Council of Europe is by many considered uh, one of the leading European human rights institutions made up of 47 member states, all states who are party to the Convention on uh, European Convention on Human Rights. We are considered the organization that safeguards human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. I work for a part of the Council of Europe that provides member states with assistance on human rights issues of LGBTI people, or as we have phrased it, um, to combat discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity. And I'm very happy to be sitting here today uh, celebrating, uh, most importantly, 
10 years of Mosaica, which I think is a fantastic achievement and a moment to um, look at what has changed in Latvia, what has changed in the region, what has not changed. And I look forward to um, learn today, to exchange ideas with you, understand better what is going on, um, talk about what should change, what um, has to go different and, and at, at what speed that need to go. And uh, towards the end of the day, come to some conclusions, um, I, I hope. I think, I think we want to have some conclusions by the end of the day, don't we? Yes, we do. Yes. yes. Um, I'm not going to speak a lot now because I'll speak probably a little bit more later today. Um, I really invite everyone to um, have an open discussion. I think that is, that is very important. And I think the key, key thing is happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. And I think um, I need to pass the floor on to my, uh, the lady on my left, Joanna Gwiazdiecka. Close? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. you are right. Of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, who is also a co-organizer of this event. Thank you very much. Um, at first, I would like to address to our friends uh, from Mosaica my best wishes for the 10th anniversary meeting. Uh, dear Christina, dear friends, I wish you a lot of successes in your future work in Latvia and in the European Union. For the 10 years, the situation of LGBT people in Central Eastern Europe has been constantly changing. The societies in the Central Eastern European countries seem to be more open. Some of those countries have adopted new legal regulation against discrimination. The discussion about the same-sex partnership has begun to be more apparent. Stereotypes against the LGBTI people don't have such a visible effect in everyday life. All these positive changes couldn't have happened without the engagement of the LGBTI people who have decided, in many cases with the difficult consequences, to come out and fight for their rights. We really appreciate this noble step. The changes created by the LGBTI people are part of the significant changes in the Central Eastern Europe for human rights and for greater democracy in the stand against any form of discrimination. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. Paldies. Um, on the message, I'm sorry. Thank you. We have also received a video greeting from the Human Rights Commissioner Nils Muzniks from the Council <coughs> of Europe. We will have a look at it. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to greet Mosaic on the 10th anniversary. Human rights are universal. They also apply to lesbians, gays, bisexuals and trans persons. However, discrimination and violence against LGBT is widespread in Europe. Not only individuals, but also prides and NGOs have suffered from violent attacks. I would like to greet Riga for the successful organization of Europe Pride last year. I hope that will mark a progress towards non-discrimination and fight against hate crimes in Latvia. Despite of violence and discrimination, we can also see progress in Europe. Several countries uh, have now adopted the legislation regarding uh, same, same gender partnership. Good examples are Denmark, Ireland, and Malta. I would like to invite other countries to follow this example and to adopt fast, transparent, and available instruments for non-discrimination. Trans persons uh, are a new or different category which uh, does not fall in the categories of uh, male and female traditionally. Sometimes the society, including doctors, are not aware of their situations and the doctors might sometimes suggest uh, surgical operations for trans persons which are not needed. Recently, I published a report on transgender persons. 
I would like to invite Mosaic to pay more attention not only to lesbians, gays, and bisexuals, but also to trans persons. And I would like to greet you on the successful work you have done before and to cooperate more on human rights. Thank you. I would like to thank Mr. Nils Mujniks for the video greeting. This part of the panel has ended, and I would like to invite the next speaker, Marco Hoene, member of the board of the political party Die Linke from Germany. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for the invitation, uh, not just for the opportunity to explore Riga like I did uh, yesterday evening, uh, rather for the instance uh, to get known to Mosaic and uh, all of you people. Um, I think we won't achieve European integration um, by building a Europe for banks or exporting concerns or maybe insurance companies. I think what we needed is an integration by culture, by the struggle for equality of opportunity and social equity. And therefore, we have to understand that we are united in one fight. 10 years of Mozaika are 10 years of progress for all of us in Europe. And on behalf of the left party in Germany, I would like to thank you for your love, for your energy, for your power and your hope. Thank you very much uh, for your work. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, one obstacle for a connected struggle are the different basics, I think, in our nation, nations. And uh, I would like to talk about the situation of LGBT in Germany. What is the situation? Well, um, I think for most of the gay people in the world, we are kind of magic kingdom with uh, unicorns dancing on rainbows. Um, Fifteen years ago, we got uh, the life partnership law. Um, this is kind of a second class marriage. And this ends the era of lawlessness for gay people. And since 2013, registered partnerships do enjoy uh, the same tax benefits as marriages. Very important for people. And by now, we just have to wait in Germany. There is still a lack of rights, of course. Uh, for example, uh, joint adoption has not yet been legislated. But uh, the Supreme Court already announced that the unequal treatment of gay couples and straight couples is against the Constitution. Well, Chancellor Merkel is not willing to follow this decision by now, uh, but there's no doubt that politicians have got to. And in Parliament, my party submitted a bill to end the situation, by the way. In 2006, by signing the Treaty of Amsterdam, uh, Germany amended its national anti-discrimination laws uh, to include sexual orientation. So uh, discrimination against LGBT is principle banned countrywide. It is also political incorrect. A poll in 2013 indicated that 87% of, of Germans sorry, viewed that homosexuality should be accepted by society. And by now, I think hip-hop is the only field in the mainstream media with an acceptance of homophobia by now. But uh, the road to equality for German LGBT people is a long one. 
and that is something I think you have to keep in mind for your own struggle as well. Uh, let me give you some spotlights. Same sex sexual activity between men was illegal till until 1969, uh, 68. But the age of consent was equalized in unified Germany in 1994. The first German Christopher Street Day took place in Berlin in 1979. But just seven years later, in 1986, the popular soap opera called Lindenstraße showed the first gay kiss on German television. These achievements are evidence for a good organization of the LGBT community in Germany. In fact, you will find a widespread number of organizations. For, um, for example, we got um, the LSUD. This means Lesbian and Gay Society. It's a kind of lobbying organization who promotes gay rights on a high political level. <coughs> on the other hand, we got something like uh, Rosa Liste in Munich. Rosa Liste means uh, pink list and was formed in 1989. And it's like a party, but just for the municipality. So they make gay power politics just in the town council of Munich. And there's a society like Haki in my hometown, Kiel. And Haki is short for Homosexual Action Kiel. And they are active uh, more in self-help. So there are different groups of transgender or gay students or whatever who can have a home there to discuss their issues and um, uh, provide support in questions of coming out and so on. And almost every party in Germany has inner working groups who bring forward LGBT issues on the programmatic of their party. Even the Christian Democratic Union, the party of Angela Merkel, has got such a working group. And, as I heard uh, also in Latvia, we had a few openly gay politicians like Klaus Wowereit. Um, he was the major of Berlin for 13 years. So, um, you can see the LGBT movement in Germany is very plural, uh, but active and on all levels. It has strong advocates in the parliament, and the su uh, Supreme Court is on its side. Um, but in fact, in the reality of life, there are no dancing unicorns by now. Uh, the most popular absurd word in the schoolyard is still gay. The structural discrimination by the state is mostly gone, but the social discrimination at work or in family, by friends, in school, or in sport clubs is vast. More than two-thirds of homosexual men experience slander and harassment in daily life. One-third reports physical violence. I myself can, uh, was attacked once. The risk of suicide is four to se seven times higher in the field of young people when they are gay compared to the straight. <clears throat> and in 2014, Amnesty International criticized a massive problem with violence against transgender in Germany. And um, in these days, it's, it, this seems not like a dying problem. Uh, in these days, we live to see a rise of right-wing populists in Germany. They are supported by a part of the population which is afraid of refugees or critical to the European Union. They dream of renationalization and uh, backward-looking culture. Last Sunday in Stuttgart, the town I was born, up to 5,000 people demonstrated against a sexual education that includes lesbians and gays. Uh, I think it was a ghoulish bunch of people. Uh, they don't look good. 
But with the party alternative for Germany, there's a new player in the political area who gives these people a voice in parliaments. Up to now, there are in some parliaments of uh, federal states in Germany, and surveys show them at 10 or 12 percent. Next weekend, there will be an election in the federal state of Sachsen-Anhalt, and they could become stronger than social democrats. This is a real threat, a threat for all achievements we made in Germany. It is a real threat for a better future and free life in Europe as well. As you know, these right-wing populists are not only a problem in Germany. And um, I think that will be the main fight for us in Germany for the next years. On the one hand, we will get an equality by law, but on the street, I think there will be more hate supported by the rise of a reactionary political movement. I have to say this, this movement is a minority. As we see it now, it is not able to achieve real political power in parliaments. Um, but it is able to radicalize the part of the population which is anti-gay rights. And um, ladies and gentlemen, not far from the Russian border, I want to admit uh, something. Many of these right-wing populists are getting support by the Kremlin. The Front National in France gets a credit at millions of euro. Putin has good ties to the Jobbik party in Hungary. Leaders of the alternative for Germany were several times invited to the Russian embassy or to St. Petersburg where they have discussions with Putin's party, United Russia. Vladimir Putin supports homophobia not only in Russia, he is also supporting homophobia in Europe. And this is a threat we have to deal with. And I said it loud and clear to Mr. Putin and all of his ghoulish friends, you cannot fight love. Our love, your love, will be stronger. Will be stronger than this hate can ever be. We won't give up until unicorns will dance on rainbows. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, now I would like to invite Greg Chernetsky from Open Society Foundation to give us a little overview of what's going on in Europe right now. Uh, good morning. I just want to say that um, I was talking to my friends that uh, I visited Oslo last weekend to talk about uh, LGBT rights as well and I thought it would be a great idea to swim in the fjord because that's what they do there. So I'm a little bit sick now. <laughs> I can't hear myself speak. Um, so uh, I apologize in advance if, um, if, I, if I'm not speaking um, clearly or if I'm speaking very slowly. This is why. Um, so uh, it's really nice to be here. I work for the Open Society Foundations. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a foundation that funds uh, mostly human rights um, activities, organizations. I'm the LGBTI program officer for this region, meaning Central Eastern Europe, Eurasia, all the way to Mongolia. Mongolia. So um, I also have a lot to do with Putin. <laughs> Not so much, actually. Now we can't fund in Russia anymore. But um, I was thinking about what to say today. I saw that there was some uh, uh, discussions or some panels later about the positive examples um, and ways forward. So I thought, why not focus on the bad stuff? <laughs> That's the easiest. Um, so. I don't know if I can give a very comprehensive overview of what's happening in Europe uh, in general. Like I said, I do focus mostly on Central Europe and then more East. Um, but I did think that maybe an interesting thing would be to look at the backlash that's been coming um, to us in the region, but not only East, Central Eastern Europe. Um, it's also coming in Western Europe where a lot of people thought the job was done. 
Um, because I fund LGBTI organizations in this region, I do notice that a lot of the activists uh, uh, are kind of taken by surprise by what's happening. Um, I think a lot of us thought that um, some things, there was a general and is, I think, a general arc of progress. Um, and then when we get kind of hit by, by, some, by some of the things that are happening now, we're, we're a little bit taken by surprise. Um, I, just to give you some personal information, I'm Polish-American, so I grew up in the United States, but I was living in Poland for the last, for about 12 years, working for the um, Campaign Against Homophobia, which is a national LGBT uh, organization in Poland. Um, and um, one of our first campaigns in 2003 was called Let Them See Us, um, and some of you might know it. I can... Um, so it was a public awareness campaign. And I think, again, this is Johan from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation rightly, um, I think, said that the visibility that we have as a community is really a huge step. I mean, it's maybe one of the first most important steps that have really um, sent the LGBTI movement forward in this region. Um, and I was lucky to be there when this happened. It was a huge um, splash all over the media. People lost their jobs because of this, because uh, they showed this exhibit in museums. Um, there was a lot of talk, and basically this kind of was probably the biggest event that put LGBTI issues um, on the, in the public discourse in Poland. Um, and I think, again, uh, you know, it, it's no... It's no, I'm, I'm not um, saying anything extremely smart here by saying with more visibility, there's more chance for backlash. But first, um, I think this visibility did allow us in Poland to go really far forward with visibility with, um, excuse me, that's not me, I swear to God. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe, yeah, the lights could be dimmer if you wanna see the, pro yeah, thanks. It's more intimate this way. <laughs> so these, um, after some of our, a lot of our visibility campaigns, things really went forward in Poland. We elected two openly, well, one openly gay, one openly trans members of parliament a couple of years ago. Um, and I think uh, anyone who lives in Latvia can only, uh, or in the region knows that the situation went quickly backwards in Poland. So um, this is again, I think, uh, an example, Poland as an example of where we thought we were going forward so fast, and we were going forward and we are going forward, I think, fast in many ways. Um, but this backlash kind of, um, again, kind of took us, I think, a little bit, by, well, them by surprise. So I'm gonna be looking at the neoconservative um, ideology that's fueling this. You can call this a diff kind of this phenomenon a couple different things. I guess all the titles or labels have some problems. So some people call it the religious right that's doing this. Some people call it the right wing religious attack. I think neoconservative might uh, be m most appropriate. Um, but this kind of uh, ideology or this, this movement that's coming around Europe um, comes in many forms, and it's obviously part of a larger movement. Um, but the aim of what we see is to manipulate religious discourse and use the public space. Um, I'm going to focus today, i got to time myself so I don't keep you guys too long, but um, I'm going to focus today mostly um, on, the, on the Catholic Church and what it's doing around the region. I think that's one of the strongest players in this. Um, again, I'm Polish, so I was raised Catholic, so maybe I have a personal grudge <laughs> against the Polish Church, uh, against the Catholic Church. Um, but naturally, there are others that kind of can uh, do similar um, work. So the Orthodox Church um, in the Bal Western Balkans, in Russia, um, and other neoconservative elements are out there, but I think the Catholic Church does some really, I think they excel in this kind of new attack. Um, so I think it's worth looking at. And uh, what we've observed at this is that this ideology focuses um, on three areas. 
Um, one is life, and, and so when they're, their work here is mostly, I think, focused around abortion and reproductive rights, so taking back reproductive rights. This, I think, is also interesting because in a lot of countries in this region, especially former Soviet Union, abortion was never really debated or it was there. There were rights to um, the right to, to abortion, to pro-choice. Poland, of course, is a, is a different case. Um, but uh, I think a lot of reproductive rights organizations and women's rights organizations in this region are also a little bit surprised that this might be um, an area that they're going to have to fight for. So I think a lot of women's rights organizations and activists in the region kind of never had to work with um, fighting to defend the right to, to choice, to, to abortion. So that's going to be one area. Family, of course, is what we're probably talking about most, which is same-sex partnership or um, uh, defining how we define a family in vitro as well. And religious freedom, so this is also where they're, they're defining, you know, kind of trying to stop the progress. This is like foster care, so I think we've heard cases, some of you might have heard cases in the UK where um, they're trying to stop kids being adopted or taken into foster care by same-sex couples. Um, it's also conscientious, conscientious objection, um, which is also usually tied to, uh, tied to um, choice to reproductive rights so that the doctors don't have to perform abortions if they don't want to. Um, and that religious freedom, of course, is kind of twisted because they're painting themselves as the victims, right? That the Christians are not able to uh, live under this kind of dictatorship of PC or the progressives. Um, so that's, these are the three areas that they're, they're really working on. Now the strategies that we see happening, um, which is quite frightening as well, um, are they're using new tools which I don't think that they had been um, so much before. Um, and these are civil initiatives, what they call online media, uh, social networking. So again, I think these are types of um, tools that the progressives, we human rights organizations were using, we are using and do use a lot. And I think they realize that this is a good method. Um, so Citizen Go, um, some of you might know, is like the Avas of the dark side. It's the, the kind of conservative version of Avas. So it's also <coughs> excuse me, meant to gain lots of uh, uh, signatures and petitions. Um, and uh, don't even ask me how to pronounce that second one. It looks like hate something, but I know it's in French. Has <laughs> the org um, is another one. And with these methods, with these tools, they are also getting tens and thousands of mails to European parliamentary members, blocking mailboxes, stopping reports from going through at the European level. Um, and they're also mobilizing. Um, mobilizing people to come out with these with these tools again I think these are things that we didn't expect in a lot of places so this is um, in Spain I think if anyone needs Spanish let me make sure <laughs> that I'm not screwing this up where um, they passed an anti-abortion law a few years ago and it was retracted but they managed to get you know thousands of people out um, in Spain to, to you know retract uh, reproductive rights, which again, I think a lot of would, people would not have expected in Spain of all places. Um, I also know last time we were here, I think at Baltic, uh, not here, but in Lithuania, Baltic Pride, the Estonian activists were telling us that they were gathering petitions, uh, signatures on a petition in Estonia to um, block LGBTI rights and they managed uh, to get 40,000 signatures and Estonia, as we know, is not a religious country. Um, compared to to the others in Europe, so it's really something to look out for because um, I think we might underestimate uh, the power that they have to mobilize people, even in places where we think are fairly progressive. Um, I think this is. I think most of you would have heard of this, of course, as well, which is this Manif Portu, the 2013 pro mass protests. Again, thanks to that French, um, in part thanks to that French uh, online tool. 
Um, and these protests, um, which of course were to, which is for the traditional family or family values, they managed to have protests or demonstrations in Rome, Warsaw, Madrid, Brussels, Budapest um, in 2014. I mean, it's two years ago, and things are, hap uh, are continuing, but it's an important thing to um, trend to watch. Um, another interesting one, a uh, demonstration like this was in Slovakia in December 2013, where 100,000 people um, came out in a march for life, um, which was against euthanasia, abortion, and registered partnership in Košice, Slovakia. And I don't know if anyone's been to Košice in December, <laughs> in any December, but that's not the time or the place you want to go marching around. So if they managed to get 100,000 people, um, because, you know, uh, we were really trying to examine what happened in France, in Paris, that they managed to get so many people out. We know that French people like to protest, and they're, they're, it's very easy to go out in the streets in France. But I was really shocked as well with some of my friends who are activists in France. And one of my friends said uh, he and his partner, um, his partner's parents are from the village somewhere in France. And uh, they called, the parents called him and his partner who live in Paris and they said, oh, by the way, we're coming this weekend so we should have lunch on Sunday. And my friend said, well, why don't we have it on Saturday? It's better for us. And they said, no, 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 we have something to do on Saturday so Sunday will be better. And they said, well, what are you doing in Paris this weekend? And they said, oh, they organized this trip for us, a free bus ride to Paris and we get to come. And they had no, they basically had no idea what they were coming to. And these are parents who have, gay, you know, a gay couple in their family. Um, and so there is obviously some manipulation um, and a free bus trip to Paris, I guess, why not? Um, so, you know, obviously we have to look at these dynamics of this populist and manipulative uh, tools they're using. Um, and if we look at the messages that they're, they're spreading or they're working with, they're very simple. Again, this is not, I guess for us, it's not so shocking, but the messages that they have are very simple and absolute, right? They're principles of family values. Um, they tell us it's about the future and about belonging to a family or security of the family um, versus the fear that people have now, of course, of this hate towards others, scapegoating. And of course, now this is really um, amplified or is made worse by the Islamophobia that's coming and this fear of, of kind of losing the Christian uh, kind of, I don't know what, characteristics of Europe. So I think the refugee issue um, that's, that's, you know, all over Europe now is feeding into this a little bit. Again, this is also a bit twisted because some of you might have heard a few weeks ago or last week, Viktor Orban, who is no friend of any of ours, I hope, here. <laughs> but he, said, he made a statement saying something, we have to stop this... Um, influx of refugees from Muslim countries um, because they're going to increase sexism, Islamophobia, no, so not this, sexism, anti-Semitism, and homophobia in Europe. So he's helping us <laughs> now to stop these homophobic Muslims coming in. So it is a bit twisted um, the way things are coming out, but usually I think the Islamophobia is playing into their hands and saying that family values are, are threatened in Europe. Um, and uh, recently, uh, I think the Catholic Church's best weapon has been gender ideology. Um, and I don't know, because um, Latvia is not really a Catholic country, but for the Latvians here, is this term used here as well? It is, okay. So it's not only the Catholic Church. But um, of course, Catholic ideology, uh, um, Catholic ideology, <laughs> gender ideology, quote unquote, I should put quotes around gender ideology, um, is what the Catholic Church is saying is this attack on the natural heterosexual cisgender, but they probably wouldn't use that term, family. Um, it's a pseudo-scientific term. Um, you know, I don't think there really is anything to back it up, but it, negate, it says that gender ideology, is, which is what we're using, um, negates the binary and complementary characteristics of sex and gender. Um, and it's perfect for them because it can encompass both the uh, L, you know, LGBTI activists and agenda and feminists or women's rights as well at the same time. Um, 
Another thing that, you know, it's interesting is for most of our countries, the good thing is that gender in itself um, is perfect because it's a foreign word. Uh, so most places, I don't know, again, here in Latvia, but in Polish, it's gender, or I don't know, it's usually there's no word to translate it into a local language. So it's scary. People don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, for a normal person on the street, they don't know what it means at all, and so it's easy to make it um, very frightening for them if you use it that way. Although we have to be... Um, yeah, so that's something that we need to, to, to see is that it's, it's very easy to use that term in a manipulative way. And this is an example of that. And I don't know for any of the Polish people in here, I didn't remember where I saw this. Um, it, obviously, it could be just an internet meme. Um, but this is like the, this is encapsulates how it is seen in Poland. So it's this like gender monster who's going to come for you if you're, if you're bad in any way. Um, and it's got everything in there. And I don't know what the hell that gender monster is even saying. But um, I think a lot of people in Poland think this is what gender is. It's something that is coming to get you. Um, and it's going to screw up your whole family, your whole life. Um, the, uh, you know, of course, this is, so this is seeping in through the public discourse. Um, I think in a lot of countries. Apart from that, uh, I think in a lot of countries also, we, um, it, it's taking a more dangerous form. So in the Polish um, parliament, in the same, there's a stop gender ideology uh, committee or something. Um, what is it? A special committee, yeah. Um, when Anja Grotska, the trans uh, member of parliament, was still member of parliament, I think she joined to kind of, uh, as a tro trolling from within. Um, but it was made up, last I checked, I don't know now again with the new parliament, but it was one woman, this one, and 15 men, of course, working on gender. Um, and again, it, it's just, it's so easy um, for them to make ridiculous arguments um, using gender that people will buy. And so this member of parliament, um, I, I don't know if you guys also had a debate about the Istanbul Convention against all forms of violence. I, the, the title is really long. Um, again, it was another really, the, the, the way that they twisted how not to implement this convention, which is about violence against women. I mean, it should be an all things considered, it should be a pretty easy thing to, 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 to agree on as a society that we shouldn't be violent against women. Um, and the debate in Poland included this woman who said, uh, when they were debating if we should ratify or accept this convention, she said, if a gay who is in a relationship with another man, another man comes and says he's been beaten up and he is the woman of the relationship, will he be considered a victim according to this convention? So that's the level of the debate. This was, again, a couple of years ago, but still, um, it's amazing how, they, how, how they've managed to twist a lot of these things. Um, the interesting thing also in some of these um, debates or some of the things that are happening um, <coughs> is that they're becoming much more... <coughs> I don't know if much more, but they're changing their PR strategy, this conserve, neoconservative uh, attack. So Slovenia is an interesting also case. Um, I think probably most of you have heard all these referendums I've had about same-sex marriage partnership unions in the last couple of years. Um, it's also an interesting case because it, it is um, mostly, I think, majority Catholic, but not very religious. So... Again, this is not, it shouldn't always be the most, um, the easiest place to use Catholic or religious rhetoric. Um, and what we found, according to uh, a friend of mine, Roman Kuhar, who is an academic and was studying this, was that in the debates they had about same-sex partnership in 2009 um, on the family code, so they were talking about changing or, or amending the family code, which would include, could include same-sex partnership or concept of family wider than just man and a woman. Um, it was very much, um, uh, it was very much, uh, I'm sorry, this was 2003, I'm sorry, that was 2003, so even earlier, very much focused on um, religious argumentation. 
Um, so then it was, uh, uh, in 2003, it was very much the Roman Catholic Church was using rhetoric in the, in the media about uh, God and the Bible, about how God didn't create homosexuals and about abomination and, and very much this kind of very rough kind of um, religious talk, which probably resonated with some people. Now, um, then in 2009, when they had another debate about this, it, it switched and it was much more about scientific kind of argumentations and their, their PR strategy was much more kind of modern and slick and it didn't seem like it was even that um, connected to the Catholic Church. So this is a um, site, a website, um, which is a, they call themselves a citizens group. Again, this is another tool that they're using is to say that these, all these new organizations all around Europe are popping up by citizens who just, you know, feel the need to defend family. Um, and they're really stepping back, the Catholic Church is stepping back from the, from the forefront to make it look like it's really from the bottom up. And this uh, website is one of those types of organizations and it's actually hosted on the Roman Catholic Church's server. So they won't mention it anywhere, of course I don't read Slovene, but um, it does not mention that it's funded by the, the Catholic Church. Um, but it definitely is. And then, uh, and then organiz uh, websites like this have lots of studies and scientific s studies that say, you know, there's a higher chance, 100% higher chance of um, same-sex violence in same-sex partners, um, in partner violence, or, you know, a lot of these bullshit arguments, excuse me, a lot of these um, arguments which are obviously not uh, scientifically found, uh, backed up and are debunked or not taken seriously in the U.S., but can be used here, again, in, populist, uh, in their populist agenda. So a lot of these organizations um, that disguise themselves as citizens organizations or, or foundations or businesses and charities are not claiming to be Catholic and they're in the name of everybody or they're the moral majority um, but are really funded by the Catholic Church. And the last example I'll use will be um, the Croatian example next door to Slovenia which is also an interesting one because they had a referendum in 2013, again, I think a lot of you would have heard of this, um, about uh, marriage and defining it as a, between a man and a woman. Um, again, I think Croatia is an interesting case because it is Catholic, and I know during the war, with all the war in the Balkans, they use their religion also as an identifying marker. Um, but on the ground, I think it wasn't that conservative or Catholic um, compared to some other countries in Europe. Um, but it was the newest member of the European Union, and I think the Cat we think that the Catholic Church was using it as a testing ground, that they need to stop this progress that's been happening in Europe legally um, on LGBTI rights, and, and Croatia was going to be a place that they were going to show that this has got to stop and that they were going to show that they could stop it. So um, this campaign came out to stop, uh, to define marriage as a pen, between a man and a woman. Um, and it wasn't, sh it wasn't clear where the money was coming from for this campaign. Um, uh, so activists from LGBTI organizations were trying to find out and they couldn't really find where the money was coming from. But it was obvious that it, the Catholic element was there in the, in the logos. Logos, of course, and, and um, uh, what do you call it in English? Haswa, like the, the, the slogans that are being used. You can see also a pattern from France to Croatia to even Estonia. So you can see that there's something um, together by the Catholic Church being organized. And this campaign, they had, to, um, they had to get signatures within two weeks, according to Croatian law for a referendum, to be um, accepted. They had 6,000 volunteers around the country, um, 2,000 signing stations around the country in these two weeks, and the Archbishop, of course, urging people to vote. So obviously this I mean, this is not just a spontaneous action of 6,000 people standing around the streets doing this. 
Um, the woman who led it is Jelka Markic, and she's a medical doctor, in the na and she heads this organization called In the Name of Family. Um, the organization ran for, for um, in the elections recently in Croatia and didn't win, actually was, had a very low outcome. So, so this is also interesting because they don't get a lot of support when it comes to elections. This, this party that she started wouldn't get a lot of support. But they managed to gain enough votes, uh, uh, not, not enough votes, enough signatures well above well, well above the, um, the minimum that you need for a referendum in these two weeks. Um, and uh, the interesting, uh, I don't know if, maybe I don't have too much time left, okay. Um, the interesting thing was that they, um, <coughs> um, <coughs> these are some statistics actually, I don't know if, they were looking at why people would vote, uh, so the LGBT organizations were looking at why people would vote for this uh, for this this referendum, and a lot of people were saying for normality, 68 percent, not for religious arguments. And so this is again um, showing that the church knows this, and the church is using this populist rhetoric, um, not saying that the Bible says this, that, and the other, not saying that you know. Uh, priests, whatever. It's not using religious argumentation, but it's using arguments that are really kind of more smoothed over. Normal um, family values and uh, kind of security of family. So I think I'll end with that. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what others are going to say on the panel later uh, about moving forward and um, I see Brian is here from Ireland, and so there will be other positive examples of where we can use um, or change maybe our kind of tactics in light of this. So if we know that um, they're using these populist kind of very general uh, slogans and just kind of um, PR campaigns, which are very easy, then maybe we should be thinking about that. Of course, I'm not advocating for a populist strategy <laughs> of us to, to lie and manipulate to the... <laughs> to the population, although I'm very tempted to do that sometimes as well. But I'd like to see how, um, how that, you know, what we're thinking about the, the movement going forward. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Really interesting and definitely, definitely lots of things are very familiar for us as well here in Latvia. Thank you. We heard really interesting presentation. A lot of things are well known here in Latvia and for us as well. Now we will have a small break, a coffee break, which will take place behind and at the back of the hall. We also have a balcony where you can go out and breathe some fresh air. And please come be back at 11 o'clock. So we have 30 minutes.